This is a secret history of fire. It does not revere those who tame it, those keepers of the flame who capture it to drive the pistons of an engine or beam electrical signals across a wire. Rather, its true champions are those who understand its cosmic nature. Not the propulsion of the Big Bang, but instead the flaming supernovas that consume whole worlds. For in the end, fire proves to be uncontrollable. This is a history of such ungovernability at its most primordial. We begin with two stories. The first begins on the early morning of July 9th, 1937, which is when the Fox Film Vault went up in flames. The vanishing of an archive dedicated to historical preservation presented a paradoxical image of history. There and then not. First present and then absent. Never to be recovered. Something turned into nothing. Certainly, a few bits and pieces were not completely combusted. Fragmented remains were thrown off like sparks or soot. Perhaps a number of those pieces may still be lit, simmering embers buried deep in the recesses of time. But the whole was lost forever. The vault fire was caused by nitrate film spontaneously igniting. Such an event is not exceptional. It is the fate that awaits all cinema in its totality. For, on a long time frame, film decays into nothing. This makes the disappearance of movies not a question of if, but only of when. It reveals the fate of all archives. The best any monument to time can hope for is to delay its own self-destruction. In the instance of the Fox Vault fire, Enough of gas is gathered to make everything go up in flames. It is not a coincidence, as all film begins as light before it is captured in photographic light writing. As if returning to its primordial home as part of the brilliance of the sun, the archive self immolated Light reclaimed itself in a hot blaze. Our next story occurs six years after the Vault Fire. This one is a tale in the early days of military operations research during World War II. OR, Operations Research, was a new way of thinking that saw the world as something that could be mapped out into a series of decisive steps with mathematical specificity. The most crucial piece of machinery was calculation as embodied in the device of computers. Computers were initially people, like the typewriter before it, in which there was no conceptual or linguistic distinction between the machine and the person who used it, usually a woman. And the rise of OR after the war would place computers in decision-making positions, spreading machines throughout all society. As the story goes, wartime operations analysts located in a German factory complex manufacturing ball bearings. The idea was that if analysts paid enough attention to small details in the whole chain of operations, 
they could find an unexpected weak point within the bolts, screws, clips and springs that held together fighting machines, analysts found that the Nazis had centralized ball bearing production to a small town in Bavaria. Destroying its factories, they hypothesized, would cause a massive shortage that would force the whole of the German war machine to grind to a halt. Armed with this strategic plan, in late 1943, the United States 8th Air Force conducted a massive bombing raid. But it was a failure. Not only did Germany exact heavy loss of life and airplanes, but the Nazis had already amassed an enormous reserve of ball bearings, whereby even if the bombing was a success, it would have had little impact. So in the end, it was a double defeat. Not only was the strategy a failure, its failure was exacted in blood. Even then, some would claim the failing was only in its execution, not the design of OR. The deep irony is that OR's promise was too powerful to ignore, even after such a monumental failure. Time and again, OR's highly technical decision modeling approach would break down, as in Robert McNamara's cold calculating war on Vietnam through latitudinal numbers and precisely figured body counts broadcast on the nightly news. And in turn, the bloody march of computation came to hide behind a series of numbers, graphs and commands. Fast forward to 2020. Browsing through a copy of the French magazine Terminal, we stumble across an interview with a group. Instead of the spontaneous combustion of film, they seem to have discovered the self-destruction of cybernetic computation. The group called themselves Comité Liquidant ou Détournant les Ordinateurs, or CLODO, an acronym panning off the slang for a homeless bum. They confess to being computer workers. Their cunning verbal assaults on computers seem to be backed by real attacks. So while funny, we took literally their words. In particular, we were struck by how casually they said that there is nothing more ordinary than throwing a match on a package of magnetic tapes. We found ourselves immediately attracted by the force of their words and were compelled to know more about this elusive collective. At once outrageous and logical, there is something alluring about them. Interesting as the most about Clodo is not the intensity of their actions, though this is a part of it, as they spoke loudly through their bombs and graffiti that accompanied their assault on computers. Our deepest fascination, instead, rests with their sudden disappearance. After a string of inflammatory attacks over a few short years, they went silent, never to be heard from again. That means that Clodot persists only as evidence, the traces of their actions remaining only in what was collected in the newspaper articles, legal documents and photographic images that chronicle the aftermath of their actions. It was almost as if Clodot was conjured out of thin air, like the build-up of nitrate gases growing in pressure until they exploded a film archive or computer terminal, only to dissolve back into nothing as the flames dissipated. What does this disappearance mean? Were they never found? It is possible that Clodot still lives among us, or that it was made real only through actions. And if so, when the assaults ended, maybe all of what remained of Clodot got consumed. All that was left burned to ash, like the fragments of celluloid at the Fox Vault. Our search initially put us at odds with Clodot, who had clogged themselves in anonymity. We are left to wonder whether anything can be said about the events almost a half century after they occurred. Those looking to answer these questions no doubt look to the repository of the Internet, 
The World Wide Web is our world's global archive and it looms large over our present. Via this online archive, we sketch an initial image of Clodot. We learn that they committed a dozen or so attacks in the early 1980s. Their main targets were information processing in the city of Toulouse, in southern France, and at least one in Paris. With some effort, we identify the legal names of the firms and precise addresses as well as details about the computer models and software packages that they burned to ashes. A local anarchist social centre was especially helpful in our search, furnishing us with digital scans of the whole dossier, brimming full of news clippings. Everyday Toulousians seemed obsessed with the group. News outlets were crazed. Le groupe Action Directe revendique aujourd'hui le sabotage des ordinateurs de la société Philippe de Toulouse. C'est par un message téléphonique à l'agence France Presse que le groupe a fait cette annonce 48 heures après la Pierre. C'est dans la nuit de samedi à dimanche que les saboteurs ont opéré, brûlant les programmes d'ordinateurs et les fiches magnétiques et endommageant certaines pièces des appareils. Un travail de professionnel selon le directeur de la société. Ce matin, le sabotage était revendiqué par le groupe Action Direct par téléphone à l'AFP. Ce que nous avons découvert dans les locaux de Philips Informatique était destiné à la Défense Nationale et au SDEC et sera divulgué prochainement et publiquement dans les jours qui vont suivre, précise le communiqué. Ajoutant que le groupe signera désormais Action Direct des 27 et 28 mars 1980 et que l'organisation n'en restera pas là. Après le coup de filet du 28 mars, 15 des 19 personnes arrêtées ont été inculpées par le juge d'instruction à la Cour de Sûreté de l'État d'attentats par explosifs, tentatives de meurtre et associations de malfaiteurs. Ces chefs d'accusation sont en relation avec une entreprise consistant ou tendant à substituer une autorité illégale à l'autorité de l'État. Par leurs récentes actions, le groupe prouvait donc sa possibilité d'agir malgré les arrestations du 28 mars dernier. Donc vous venez d'entendre, ce soir, la Cour de Sûreté de l'État a été saisie du dossier de cette affaire, de cet attentat de samedi à Toulouse. At the time, the police considered Clodot an offshoot of Action Directe, an urban guerrilla movement made infamous for killing René Audron, an official in the French Ministry of Defense. But by our estimate, Clodot was too playful and witty to be just one more of the pensive armed militant groups that stalked the late 1970s. Answers to subsequently journalistic questions of what, where and when were easy to find, but none of them felt like they got us any closer to knowing Clodot, let alone understanding their sudden disappearance. But then, a revelation. Our failure was embedded deep within our method. We were chasing Clodot just like the police. In a twisted way, we had continued the work that the French police authorities had started in 1980. We began our search with the advanced investigatory computational tools against which Clodot had so ferociously fought. Our tools could track Clodot with far more sophistication than they could have imagined. Computers were solitary, lumbering giants in their day, not the ultralight internet-connected devices that now saturate most of the globe. But even with these tools at our disposal, we were just as useless as the police, unable to capture Clodot. Perhaps it is because Clodot was cunningly created to evade such pursuits. The self-professed computer workers, after which we were chasing, knew enough to craft techniques to conceal their footprints. Did this concealment contribute to Clodot's demise? To know Clodot, we realized it would take more than following in their footsteps. The forensic detective work that would allow us to create a profile to capture Clodot was useless. It would tell us nothing new in our inquiry into self-destruction. It was at that moment that we decided to climb inside their head and conjure up the same passions. Knowing Clodot would require becoming Clodot. We would have to visit Toulouse become familiar with the same streets they walked, stake out the same buildings they watched late at night, ask similar questions about the complicity between computation and everything intolerable about our world, and search deep within ourselves for the same reservoir of anger that drove them to their actions.
Clodot's first attack in their war on computer sites occurred on the night of April 6, 1980. Around three o'clock in the morning, they jumped a fence and snuck into the offices of Philips Data Systems via a tilted window on the ground floor. They collected computer programs and magnetic data cards, then burned those in the toilets using a match and some newspapers. On their way out, they crippled the computers and stole all the personnel files. They entered and left with the swiftness of a seasoned burglar, leaving behind no traces. Too intelligent to be the work of vandals, the newspapers concluded. The total damage, those same newspapers reported, was evaluated at more than two million francs. It's difficult to understand what led Clodot to Philips. Certain events must have built up enough resentment to make the attack a reasonable reaction. Something must have surely made Philips so intolerable that Clodot marked their computers for destruction. Very least, we are left to speculate, there must have been something unique about the company's computer programs, data stored or magnetic cards and personnel files. And something must have precipitated the attack that made Clodot finally explode. Two days after the events, the director of Philips Data Systems said Clodot had simply sought to deprive society of its computer memory, its collective digital archive. He failed to consider the following more plausible scenario. In 1974, the Minister of Defense was quoted in the newspaper Libération, announcing the military's major investment in computers. They presented, he said, a powerful machine in anticipation of a social crisis in which the internal enemy emerges. Philips Data Systems profited from this sector. They provided computers to the counter-espionage services. In Philips, Clodot may have found a vulnerable node between policing and corporate cybernetics. In the communique sent to Libération after the attack, they said that in the hands of the military and police, the computer becomes the preferred tool of the dominant. It is used to exploit, to file, to control, to repress. It should, they wagered, be burned to the ground. Still, one attack could be dismissed as an outburst perhaps the work of an isolated worker who had grown tired of the dignities of information work. But Clodot undertook a series of actions which implies coordination and purpose. The internal enemy that computers were meant to neutralize had struck back. They were not the first internal enemies of social war to lay siege to Toulouse. The already dead haunted colonization and the perverse march of modernization. But now, the internal enemy wielded fire and bore a name, Clodot. Thank you.
Each attack is a dot on a map, with logic filling the space between them. The logic acts as a string holding them all together. After Phillips, the second dot appeared on a busy street. At 3 a.m. on April 8, 1980, some Toulousians woke up to the smell of smoke. They looked out of their windows. The computer firm said to Z. Hannuel Bull was in flames. It was one more step in an already familiar sequence that was beginning to emerge. Clodot finds a path into an office, gathers computers, records and data cards in the lobby and sets all of it ablaze with a Molotov cocktail. Clodot leaves before authorities arrive. The attack confirmed that Clodot was not striking at one particular company, nor technology in general. Their target was something deeper and more systematic. This is what distinguishes Clodot's attacks from those of Luddites. Unlike the loom breakers of the 19th century, they neither expressed fear over machinery replacing crafts, nor workerist concerns over the conditions of labor. Nor was their attack a primitivist call for a return to early societies. It is stupid to try and turn back the clock, they wrote in their self-interview. Even still, Clodot denounced the current evolutionary path of computers. We are essentially attacking what these tools lead to, they wrote, files, surveillance by means of badges and cards. And those things were exactly the tools of Sedouzi Hanuel Bull. Before merging with Hanuel Bull, Sedouzi was established by the Plan Calcul. The controversial plan, financed by the French government, continued efforts started in the mid-1960s. French officials launched research institutes and began offering subsidies to the computer industries, furthering the manufacturing and researching of commercial and military computers. Rather than attacking a particular technology or even a specific company, what Clodot attacked was a generalized synthesis collapsing the borders between the state, capital and the military. The most traumatic version of this technology would become contemporary surveillance, whose techniques have been embedded so deeply in our everyday lives that we do not see omnipresent information collection for what it is. Whereas in the 1980s, it was much more clear how identification technology was being introduced to make tracking, management and differentiated access the primary processes through which society could be made. While on our own stakeout, we pondered if Clodot blended into friendly crowds. Neighbors may have greeted them on their way to an attack, choosing to say nothing. Alternatively, Clodot may have been completely concealed in the dead of night. Besides a few of these tactical questions lost to history, we thought we knew all there was to learn about this elusive group. But then, an acquaintance familiar with radical politics in South France, P told us she had, at some point, met someone who claimed to have been part of Clodot. She was not willing to reveal that person's identity, but she did agree to an interview with us. P told us that when Clodot launched their first attacks in 1980, Toulouse had become an experimental testing ground for various militant groups. They first tried to halt the construction of the Gulf Rennes nuclear power plant, by passive means, through collaboration with local socialist and green politicians. 
when those efforts failed, the militants started a series of bombings and sabotage. In 1979, a group calling itself police stole files from a police station in Toulouse and made them public. Two years later, the statue of Jean Jaurès, a prominent early 20th century social democrat, disappeared, only to be found some time later hanging from a tree with a noose around his neck. An attached suicide note said, Contrary to what one might think, seeing the Socialist Party rise to power has not made me particularly happy. I, Jean Jaurès, a historical defender of social democracy, who is believed to be the bearer of progress and freedom, I cannot survive this masquerade. To these groups, the ideals of socialism had faded to superficial gestures by socialist politicians. Post-war socialism became synonymous with the modernized technologies of automobiles, aeronautics, computers and more. The militant collectives did not see themselves in these social democrats. Clodot turned their back on them, casting their lot with Toulouse's radical history, acting alongside the medieval Cathar conspiracy, the German communists who came in the 40s, the outbursts of May 68, and the militant opponents to Franco fleeing the fascist crackdown in Spain. Clodot themselves opted to pair hyper-symbolism with material assault as an expression of violence. The degree of violence was matched by an uptake of rhetorical devices. Their preferred method? Graffiti. Out with computers, they wrote on the walls of the burned-out offices of Sadduzi Hannibal Bull. The ransacked walls of a hall prepared for a computerization conference read Scientist Swine, No to Capitalist Data Processing. The audacity of their actions forced local and national newspapers to reprint these words, which would have never otherwise been inked onto such sanitized pages. It is their ludic violence that separated Clodot from other militant groups active across France and Europe at the time. Others engaged in much higher stakes activity. For instance, Action Directe conducted selective killings of prominent politicians. Other groups, including Red Brigades and the Cellule Communiste Combattant, also assaulted computer sites in addition to committing political murders. But these groups were militantly serious, sharpened by rhetoric meant to imply cold precision. Clodot preferred instead the offensive logic of the hoaxer, and in turn, they avoided the rigidity of an ideological program. Clodot played with the anonymity of their appearance, multiplying hoaxes and causing violence without death. Clodot's violence was a politics of asymmetry, leaving the task of murdering people to the machines they attacked. In their penultimate and most spectacular attack, Clodot forced their way into the Toulousian offices of the American firm Sperry Univac, by climbing in via a low building in the country yard and firebombed all the computer materials they could find. In this instance, we finally learn how Clodot is connected to those other groups whose style and intentions were so different. In Clodot's own scrolled hand, we find the connection written on the walls. Regan attacks Grenada. Sperry Multinational is an accomplice. Now with material evidence, we can confidently say that Clodot was not some isolated band of pranksters. Clodot were leftists playing their part in the militant milieu. In the logic of anti-imperialism, Sperry Univac had it coming. Destruction was not an unfamiliar sight for the firm. Violence was its business model. It knew very well that computers were introduced as machines for killing. The first programmable, general-purpose electronic computer, the ENIAC, was produced in 1945. It had a singular aim, producing ballistic tables and refining hydrogen bomb design. During World War II, Sperry produced ballistics computers, bomb sightings and gun sites. After the war, they bragged about computation's abilities. Univac Scientific handles the exacting task of computing and analyzing the enormous amounts of data taken from each missile firing and turning out results fast enough to make modifications for the next firing. 
Sperry Univac was in the business of accelerating war machines. With the help of computers, the military could commit the violence of war from a safe distance. The violence had been computerized, making it so much easier to wash one's hands of it. On October 26, 1983, a day before Clodot's attack, Ronald Reagan had invaded Grenada in an obscene military attack enabled by Sperry. While overlapping with militant anti-imperialist groups who simply turned global capitalist violence back on itself like a mirror, Clodot was not a group dedicated to people's liberation. They were machine breakers whose sides never strayed from computers. They did not see computers as simple tools whose effects could be determined by whose hands they were in, as is the case with too many militants who see the state or industry as something to be seized in the name of some proletarian revolution. In targeting Sperry Univac, Clodot revealed the obscenity and horror at the root of modern computing, which is a novel form of violence that must be put to an end. Not that we are moved much by the distinction, but we still felt compelled to hypothesize. Perhaps Clodot was acting in self-defense. It was not Clodot, but Sperry Univac who drew first blood. Perhaps there's little injustice in closing the circuit of violence that computing technology initiated. Clodot seems to have just pushed the circuit of violence to its logical conclusion. All of this hypothesis led us to a profound conclusion. Without Sperry Univac and its siblings, there would never have been a Clodot. In so many words, when Sperry Univac began manufacturing the means for automatic violence, they began manufacturing Clodot. So when a fire broke out at one of their facilities, violence did not arrive like a stranger in the night. The fire was already there. Clodot simply threw accelerant on it. On our path of becoming Clodot, we tried to abandon the detective logic of the digital as we recognized within it the logic of policing, of tracing, tracking and building profiles. We had to learn and avoid the logics Clodot was conjured to dismantle. But even in trying to vacate this position, it remained far too easy to get trapped in a forensic approach. Our search not only included the archive and the database, but we entirely depended on it. According to Agamben, the Greek arche, pronounced archi, is as much a principle of commandments, of controlling, as it is one of foundations. But Clodot seemed to have realized something crucial. The archive is underpinned not simply by a desire for containment and control, but also its reverse, the uncontainable entropy that leads only to self-combustion. The archive, as Jacques Derrida reminds us in Archive Fever, is at once memory and loss, creation and destruction. Like fire, the archive is always a measure of life and death. We also found ourselves pushing back against the conventions of documentary film. Is not all documentation stuck in the fantasy of the silver bullet, or really ball bearing, where a detailed enough map and the precise amount of force can make a whole structure come tumbling down? Perhaps all we have mapped out are fantastical raids deep in enemy territory that inevitably end in failure, but also defeat. And in the process, All we did was feed the archive we should have been starving. None of these concerns are easily remedied. Films such as these cannot help but create new traces. All the worse, our focus is a collective whose very existence seems fueled by an urge for self-erasure. It is hardly much to celebrate the traces of our own investigations, interests and politics as if there is something to be won in firing the algorithmic archive with fresh impulses. Documentarians celebrate how their films renew interest in cold cases. But we would never forgive ourselves if the wrong people were back on Clodot's trail after all these years. Moreover, we doubt that Clodot would react well to seeing people, because of them sitting in neat rows with glassy eyes transfixed on a cinema screen or even worse, glued to the glow of TVs or computer screens across the world.
along the way, despite our attempts, we ourselves ended up getting stuck in machines, exactly what Clodot warned us to avoid. Ultimately, maybe this is Clodot's point. The archive cannot be undone by its own logic. This is why we are haunted by a number of questions that may never let us go. Can an attack on the archive ever be documented or represented without reiterating its logic? If the archi of the archive is the authority its contents are meant to express, can there ever be an unarchive? Or is an anti-authoritarian archive too much of a contradiction as its documents, objects, media and other contents could not subvert one form of authority only to leave a different one in its place. What would it even mean to empty authority of its form and content? Can we imagine such a self-erasing archive so hungry that it swallows everything whole? What does it mean to collect no thing? Perhaps our salvation lies in the fox vault where the spontaneous combustion of nitrate film covered the entire archive with flames. Could this film ever become Clodot and make a film that speeds up the deterioration process to the point of a compressed punctual event? What if we embedded a virus in the film? By the end of the screening, we could break the hard drive by way of irreversible encryption or disable a cooling fan, so all that is left is molten metal and plastic. Yet, if we learned anything from Clodot, it is that our appetite for destruction must be far greater. Instead, we will want the attack to jump out of a single room onto the streets and hopefully even further to the whole of society. To match this scale, we must also think in the geological time of fire. We must further the cosmic process of decay, not accidentally slow it down. Shortly after Clodot's first attacks, a magazine titled Computer World reported that around the European continent, firms with data processing technologies are moving away from big cities and adopting a perimeter fence approach instead of having entrances right from the streets. Those who were already there ramped up on security and decided to distribute their data processing activities across multiple sites. Such architectural shifts echo how archives underwent their own changes in the decades following the Fox Vault fire. By the 1980s, prevention became a primary function of archives. They were weaponized with fireproof walls, smoke detectors and fire containment systems. But as we were researching this film, we saw that corporate computing was still being haunted by fire. Just in 2021, a prominent French data center went up in flames. An uninterruptible power supply triggered the fire, destroying the five-story building which took down the millions of websites it hosted. Despite all the attempts at preventing such self-immolation, flames may always win in the end against the archive. Each beginning carries with it the potential for its own undoing. Clodot seemed to have appeared as a natural consequence of the state-sponsored rise of the computer industry in Toulouse the brashness of building a nuclear plant and violent wars abroad. At best, the state can try to anticipate responses to its own violence, but because violence ultimately begs its own undoing, it can never be fully prevented. We are reminded of Derrida's remarks on autoimmunity, in which the very forces that protect a system like liberal democracy also attack and sometimes even kill it. For all the talk about automation, we forget that there is also an automatic quality to attacks on technological sites. We were not entirely surprised then, when, months after our interview with P, our friend living in Toulouse alerted us to rumours that a new Clodot had emerged in south of France. Investigators are convinced, she said, that a recent fire at a technological hub was intentional. In a newspaper article, the police are quoted as saying, there are currently no traces of the perpetrators, but, they added, 
the hunt continues. <laughs> 